is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Let's Speak English, Teaching English Conversation Skills. I'm Nicole, uh, the Education and Training Coordinator for Florida Literacy Coalition. Uh, this webinar is hosted by FLC and made possible through the support of the Florida Department of Education, Division of Career and Adult Education. So before we get started, I want to turn everyone's attention to uh, the control panel that you should have on the side of your screen. So the first thing on this control panel you'll see is a red arrow. Um, that red arrow, if you click it, will dock your control panel and put it out of the way. Uh, if you wanna see your control panel again, you just click the button again to bring it back out. All right, next I wanna bring your attention to the questions box in your control panel. Uh, there is where you're going to ask all the questions you have for the presenter and technical questions you have for me. Uh, all technical questions I will answer privately, whereas the uh, questions you have for the presenter, I will be reading aloud so Jan can answer it to everyone. Um, throughout the webinar, you're also, you also may be asked to answer a question. So if the presenter has a question she would like to uh, get an answer to, um, you can also type your answer to that in that same questions box. All right, uh, the last thing I wanna show you is the Google Drive for the handouts. So in your control panel, you'll have a small section called chat. So if you open that up, I have already sent the link to the Google Drive. So I would like everyone to go ahead and click on that link now and open it up. On that drive, you're gonna have all the handouts for this session. This uh, session, this session's handouts will be available after the webinar as well. So you can have this um, uh, for uh, even after the webinar is over. All right, uh, if anyone has trouble kind of clicking and opening that, please type that in the questions box and I will, uh, I'll make sure that you get that link somehow. All right, so with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce our presenter today, Jan Demers. So Jan uh, is a Florida transplant from Massachusetts, where she taught first grade for 34 years before retiring in 2008. Soon after arriving in Clearwater, she joined the Literacy Council of Up Upper Pinellas, otherwise known as ELCA, um, as a tutor and a board member. For the past seven years, Jan has been co-leading English conversation classes and doing family tutoring, as well as being a regular presenter at the Florida Literacy Conference, if you recognize her name. That's probably where you've seen it. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Jan. Jan? Hi, everybody. I'm glad you could make it today. There I am on the left side of the screen in my Patriots t-shirt as Nicole said, I'm a Massachusetts transplant. My co-teacher friend, um, Robin, is kneeling on the right, and John Trusser is kneeling in front of me. Um, we're all tutors, and this is a group of our students from the Clearwater East Library. So when Pat and I um, got together in 2012, we taught a health literacy class for ESOL adults at the library. And at the end of the 12 weeks course, the students asked if it was possible to continue with English classes. So we arranged with the library to use one of their meeting rooms for our free weekly conversation class. Fast forward to 2019, and here's our latest schedule. We have sites at 10 different um, locations, including libraries, two Hispanic outreach centers, and two elementary schools. So how does an English conversation class different, differ from a regular English class? When Pat and I put our heads together at first, we were going to call it an English club. But quickly we learned that the word club was not familiar to our students, so we began to call it a class. 
but we don't have attendance requirements. We understand that our students live busy lives. Their work schedules can change. They have family obligations. We're happy that they can make it. We try to have our classes at a time of day that is convenient for people who work, um, but we also have morning and afternoon classes. We don't use a packaged curriculum. We find that we can find everything we need online. We have a library of resources for our tutors to use, and I have included a list of resources uh, as part of the handouts. We don't assess our students. We are really there to give them the opportunity to learn and practice and improve their English speaking skills. Speaking skills. We do focus on listening and speaking. So I'd like to begin by considering what must a person be able to do in order to carry on a conversation. So I invite you to jot a few thoughts down. Think of two people carrying on a conversation. What must they be able to do? I'll give you a minute to think and write. Any responses? Hi, Jen. Uh, we do Hi. have a couple of responses. Oh, OK. OK. Uh, we have ask questions, understand the questions asked, and give opinion. That's one. Mm -hmm. Understand the language uh, to communicate yeah. and understand. Mm -hmm. To listen, mm -hmm. uh, figure out how to get into the conversation. Mm -hmm. You should pay attention. Uh, have a larger vocabulary and some diction. Be able to understand vocabula the vocabulary. Listen actively and respond spontaneously, uh, not scripted or planned. Proper facial responses and body language. And knowing cultural differences and not being afraid, and that's it. These are all great responses, and they pretty much cover what I came up with. To listen and understand, and of course, in order to do that, you have to have a basic vocabulary of the language. I read recently that a typical native speaker has a vocabulary of between 15 and 20,000 words. And for regular conversational English, a speaker would need a vocabulary of about 800 word families. It's not individual words, but word families. So for instance, the word walk, would include walks, walked, walking. Um, so 800 is a um, good amount to reach for. They need to speak and be understood. And that includes work with pronunciation. They need to be able to ask and answer questions. and express opinions. They can use conversation to inform and explain. It's all about communication. And of course, they need to have confidence. So if we look at a conversation 
we have a topic and within that topic there are questions asked and answered um, there is vocabulary related to the topic and there is grammar how we use our words and put them together so let's look at some of those building blocks the best way to practice these skills of course is in context of a conversation and there are many resources and, and activities that you can do here's some examples this is a five minute activity where partners get together and try to come up with the vocabulary words to fit the categories anytime you have two or more students partnering there's conversation going on here's one where students use wh question words to choose the correct one that would fill in the blank and then they go ahead and interview each other using the questions the isl website that's listed in the resources has probably a dozen grammar meets conversation worksheets this is one of my favorites it's a great activity as a time filler if you have some time at the end of a class um, all it takes is this sheet and a deck of cards for each group and you just choose a card from the deck find it in the list and answer the question there are lots of board games too online that you can download there are even blank boards where you can make your own board game this is one that focuses on adverbs of frequency and again the adverbs are introduced as vocabulary um, i introduce them on a continuum with zero being never and a hundred being always and putting the rest of the words along the continuum and this is an opportunity for them to use those words and play a game and converse with their friends. So pronunciation is often something that teachers avoid. I think we are a little reluctant to correct our students we don't want to embarrass them and we don't often know how to teach pronunciation to our students but correct pronunciation is important to be able to be understood so not every session but every few sessions we might focus on a specific sound and do specific work on where in the mouth the sound is produced for instance the th sound is not a sound that is in spanish and in other languages this is a good place to stop to see if there are any questions um there are no questions yet um so i will let you know if anybody um uh, comes up with okay. a question okay um let me describe a speaking activity that doesn't take any preparation you have a timer and you say to the students that they're going to speak english whatever they want to say for 30 seconds 
Now, when my partner who co-teaches a class with me presented this idea, my first thought was, oh, this is going to be too challenging for our beginners. It will be stressful. But then she had the idea that we, who are struggling to speak, to learn Spanish, that we go first and we have 30 seconds. We started with 30 seconds to speak as much Spanish as possible. So we went first and the class laughed as we said things like, buenos dias, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, me gusta tacos, as if we were reading a menu in a Spanish restaurant. So they all laughed and it kind of loosened them up to see that, yes, they can, um, you know, try their best and speak as much English as they can. And, and for most of them, they were surprised at how much they could speak in 30 seconds. So that's a fun and um, great activity for students that doesn't take any preparation. Um, but, but I think it's great if the instructor, they see the instructor struggle to try to speak a language that isn't their first language too. So at the top of that little block structure that had the vocabulary, grammar, and WH questions was the word topic. So in order to have an engaging conversation, you have to have a topic. And in order to come up with a to topic, since our students come from many different countries and cultures, it's important to consider that. They are also learning how to integrate into the culture of their new country, the United States. So I like this definition of culture. I'll read it and you can read along. It's the totality of ideas, beliefs, values, activities, and knowledge of a group of individuals who share historical, geographical, religious, racial, linguistic, ethnic, or social traditions, and who transmit, reinforce, and modify those tra traditions. Um, if you look at the um, globe there and the categories, um, those are some of what we um, think of when we think of different cultures. I came across this at a conference and love the idea of the cultural iceberg. And I want you to take a minute and look at it and tell me what you notice. What do you notice about the iceberg? All right, Jan, we've got a few responses here. I'll go ahead and read mm -hmm. them off. Um, okay. There are okay topics at the bottom and not, uh, I'm sorry, there are okay topics and not so okay topics. Uh, the lower half of the iceberg is more personal. Most of, uh, most of our culture cannot be seen. Most of the mm -hmm. items are below the surface, mm -hmm. more below than above. Um, the tip of the iceberg are spoken or shared things below our personal thoughts and beliefs. Um, below has opinion. And I should say that um, there is no hierarchy to how the, um, the different ideas are listed. There's, um, it's just how they're placed there. So nature of friendship isn't higher than importance of time, 
it just how it fits on the iceberg. But yes, what you've noticed is is true. The the above the iceberg are things that we can see in people's culture. And the ones below are um greater definitions of culture that are not always as evident not always evident and um so what do you think as adults who are coming to english class um where do you think their interests would lie in topics Um, okay, so we're starting to get a couple of responses here, uh, Jen. Um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe more interest in uh, below the iceberg, um, beginners above as learning more below. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody asked you to repeat the question, actually. Okay, well, um, I was thinking um, as an adult learner, um, what kind of topics would be of interest for them to discuss. Um, so we have a couple of people here who are kind of on the same page saying that the, the topics above are going to be of more interest. We have about four or five people who say that. Um, beginners, uh, most definitely above the line, but more advanced students have language to express the info below the iceberg. Um, and other people saying um, kind of depends on their level. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that there are ways that um, even beginning English speakers can be part of discussions of some of the um, concepts below the surface. And um, we typically look at the ones above the surface as sometimes it's called the tourism curriculum you know you share the foods and the crafts and and all of that but really <clears throat> the the best and the deepest discussions go on um with subjects below the surface um can you think of any problems that could arise um, with any of these topics. Uh, Jen, while people are typing, I did actually want to, um, I did want to, um, ask a question here that somebody had. I didn't want to overlook it. Um, okay. Hold on one second. Um, so uh, someone had the question, it sounds like you create conversations, but also pause to deal with other aspects, um, pronunciation, grammar, et cetera. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and I'll um, give more examples of that later on in the session. Okay, so we do have a couple of answers here. Um, so we have um, conflicting, uh, com uh, sorry, religious beliefs can raise a lot of issues. Um, attitudes towards age can be controversial. Cultures and values can clash. Learners have different views on many of the below the surface topics and they can be very sensitive and personal. Um, uh, one would remain inquisitive as you approach the deeper topics, uh, set rules for delving into deeper, uh, delving deeper into culture. There could be disagreements amongst themselves. Um, they need to be non-judgmental when discussing some of the topics. Cultural or gender barriers could come into play. Um, and someone says, our uh, English language learners enjoy reading about and discussing moral dilemmas. 
Sometimes our volunteer English coaches mm. and ELLs like to read suspenseful novels and discuss the context in regards to uh, current events, controversial subjects, mm -hmm. and moral dilemmas. Yes. Yes, that's all true. Also, um, a lot of it has to do with how long the group has been together. Um, if you have a group just starting out, you're certainly not going to, um, or I wouldn't recommend um, talking about hot button issues. Um, wait until the, the class gets to know each other and have had other opportunities to express opinions and um, accept opinions. Any other comments? Um, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I will be referring back to the cultural iceberg, but um, I think you all have an idea in your mind um, what kind of topics would be above and which would be below. So in the next few slides, I want to give examples of some of the activities that I've done with groups. And I'd like you to look at this as um, and and think about um, what skills the students will be engaged in, um, and also thinking of that cultural iceberg um, where an activity like this might land. So we begin um, by looking at birds of a feather flock together and asking the students to, um, after we explain any words they don't know, but um, ask them to think about what it means. And then as a group, we generate a list of things that people might have in common. So things come up like language, um, gender, um, where they live, um, how old they are, um, whether they're parents or not. So um, it's pretty easy for the group to come up with five um, things that people have in common. And then they partner up and ask each other questions to find out if they have anything in common. I give them sample questions for students who might need some support. And also um, my co-leader and I would model what that would sound and look like. Then they conclude by finding three things that they have in common, writing them down, and then sharing out to the class. So what skills and concepts do you see in this activity? All right, we've got, we have a couple of um, answers now. We have a brainstorming. Mm -hmm. Um, hobbies, mm -hmm. listening, speaking, comprehension, mm -hmm. um, bonding, sharing information, mm -hmm. and I think that's it for now. What about, um, there's also questions and answers, those skills, and um, as far as the cultural iceberg, this reminds me of um, one of the items under the iceberg is the nature of friendships. So let's look at the next one. So in this one, um, after we define the word rude, we talk about 
what are the possible reactions to people who are rude. Ignore them, pretend not to see them, say something to them, give them the evil eye. And we had a lot of great discussion just on those terms. Um, and people's reactions to rudeness is very cultural. So on the left, there are um, situations. And then on the right, the student writes what they would do, what would their reaction do. Um, and then we share out. So again, let's um, consider the both the language skills and the um, cultural iceberg um, to look at this, what other students engaged in. Also, don't forget to think about vocabulary. Uh, Jan, are you uh, you're looking for them to to give responses? Yes, I want them to um, think of what skills would a student be engaged in this activity, and, and um, on the cultural iceberg, where would this topic, um, where would it be located? Okay, we have one uh, we have one response right now. Um, body language, um, how to interpret it. Um, mm -hmm. They will ex uh, examine their own values. Um, uh, body language below the line in the iceberg. Mm -hmm. um, impartial. Um, you have imagining a situation and their reaction. It's going to be uh, below the water. Mm -hmm. um, learning new vocabulary expressing opinions about rude activities, mm -hmm. visual cues, developing uh, interpersonal skills, um, manners and understanding culture. This would be below the line. Um, mm -hmm. This is in the lower half of the iceberg. Controversy, there might be disagreements. Um, intermediate level below the iceberg or below the iceberg. Um, and this is assuming that everyone believes that these activities to be rude. Yes, it's <clears throat> we're talking about societal norms and etiquette and um, rules. Um, also, um, if you look at the vocabulary, again, um, we want to have opportunities to focus on a vocab vocabulary. And the word someone um, sticks out to me in this sheet. Um, and so maybe during the same session, um, we would do work on the pronoun someone, something, somebody, somewhere, somehow. And um, then when they come to this, they have some familiarity with that term. They also have the opportunity to write. Okay, this is a, a fun activity. Um, I don't know if I'm showing my age, but they used to have Ripley's Believe It or Not in every issue of the paper. And there are some museums, I guess. There's one in Florida. But in, for this activity, um, they work in pairs. I always like to have them work in pairs or threesomes. And they match the phrases on the left with one on the right in order for the sentence to be grammatically correct. And then when they form the sentence, they have to um, say whether they believe it or not. Um, and I'll give you the heads up, all of these things are true. So this is a fun kind of activity. But if you look at the um, vocabulary, um, it's probably for more advanced students. So again, they're using their knowledge of grammar 
and also what would make sense um, in order to answer the questions. As a follow-up, we had the students write two sentences about themselves, one that was true and one that was not true. And we encouraged them to be absurd as they could. And um, then they read out their sentences and the class had to decide which one was the true sentence and which one was not. Here's an activity on relationships. We probably did this around Valentine's Day. So there's a list of different um, personality traits and they were to indicate how important these factors were in choosing a partner and rank the following um, factors. VI for very important, I for important, and N for not important. After they finished, I compiled the results on a chart and it was very interesting, um, the results. I was very surprised. Um, having the same religious background or having the same racial and ethnic background were not very important um, for most of the um, answers. Um, so that's a real culture shift from certainly um, when I was growing up um, as far as um, what was most important things that were universal were um, being patient um, having a sense of humor um, being open with their feelings feeling the same about having children being positive, easygoing, open-minded, those were the most important factors. So again, um, when the students who come from different countries and different cultures are involved in these kind of activities, they see that their um, values and um, outlook goes across culture. Any questions at this point? Anything I can clarify? And again, all of these handouts are um, included. Yeah, so um, we don't have any questions yet. Um, Catherine um, Mamani just asked if we, if you guys will receive a, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. I just wanna give you all a heads up that I have just uploaded uh, PowerPoint presentation to the Google Drive, and if you're if you still don't have it, uh, I, I noticed a lot of you were having trouble. But if you still don't have it, just um, let me know in that questions box, and I can shoot you over the the link real quick. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, let's go on. So um, I like to teach classes using a theme. When you have a theme that goes over three or four classes, it gives the students opportunities to go back and, and use and expand on vocabulary. Um, there's also opportunities to do activities that are above the waterline activities and below. Um, and I also try to find activities that will be engaging for a wide range of abilities. So one of our themes is a clothing theme and I have it listed um, as one of the handouts. 
So for a closing scene, of course, you might start with, you'd want to start with developing and expanding on vocabulary. So as you can see, this activity would be very appropriate for beginning English speakers because there's a picture and there's words to go with the picture. So they walk around the group and check out what people are wearing, ask their names, ask how to spell their names and write it on the um, space next to the picture. And then at sharing out time, they can talk about Mary is wearing a blouse. Um, John is wearing jeans and share out. Here's an activity with a little more advanced vocabulary. And it's talking about um, words connected with shopping. This is a very popular topic because you can um, introduce U.S. currency and different um, notions such as tipping, um, words like receipt. Um, we even taught them what buy one, get one means. Here's a clothing board game that has some really interesting questions for the students to ask and answer. Here's an activity where students get to pretend they're an advice columnist named Anita and they read the letters and they think of and write a response and then share their responses with their classmates. And oftentimes there are different results in um, how they respond. Other activities um, I've done that go deeper below the surface um, is, for instance, having the students um, look at the tags inside their clothing, um, inside their shoes, and write down what where they were made. And then we find those places on the maps, and then we talk about what do you notice about all these places where clothing is made. And it usually comes out that they're third world countries, then um, we might have a discussion and I share information about sweatshops. So um, there's a lot to glean from a topic. Anything anybody wants to add here? Okay, so we have a we have a question here, and we sure. have we have a comment as well. A comment. Um, okay. I uh, last just last week I explained rain check to my students, um, and then we have a question here. Some of these activities seem to be uh, good class activities where students speak, but not conversations per se. Do you consider that any class where students speak to be a conversation class? Well, yes, um, the idea is to really give them time to talk and um, and practice speaking and have something to talk about. And because they are also learning English, um, there has to be time to focus on um, vocabulary and grammar and listening and pronunciation and um yes i i would call this conversation because they're sharing ideas
Is that answer your question? Did I understand your question correctly? Um, I will let you know when she <laughs> responds okay. back. <laughs> okay. And that's it for now. She said okay. that answers her question. Okay. And was that it? Was there anything else? That's it for now. Okay. So here are my helpful hints for a conversation club facili class facilitators. I still have club in my mind. Treat your students as equals. This may be difficult for students who are used to deferring to the teacher, but keep in mind that your students are adults who have a wealth of experiences and talents that will enrich the class. Some were professionals in their former country. Others are refugees who have little um, or no education. Um, I have tried soliciting their input as to what topics they're interested in, but usually they just say, oh, you're doing fine, what, you know, whatever you do is fine. Um, I do ask them if they want to be corrected, um, and I don't do this um, while they're speaking. But as a general rule, if students are speaking and I detect a mispronunciation, instead of focusing on that particular student, I might say something like, you know, as I was listening to people talk, I noticed that um, some people are confusing the V and B sound in an English and then go on. Um, so yes, they want to work on, um, they want to have their grammar and pronunciation corrected, um, but I do it in a general way and not um, point out specific students. Be aware that there is a range of English proficiencies in the class. If there's a wide range, you may want to offer two levels of instruction. And for our English classes, most all of them have two instructors. Um, that gives you the opportunity to have one work with beginners and one with more advanced speakers. However, we always provide an opportunity, um, usually at the beginning of the class, to do an activity as a whole group. Um, Beginning ESOL, students need more vocabulary development and um, need to go at a slower pace. Uh, we came to this conclusion of a split class because um, we noticed that oftentimes a student would come and come for one class and then wouldn't come to the next class. And uh, oftentimes, these were the students who were new to English. So we began to offer a more basic class for beginning students, and that really made a difference in our attendance. I like to plan three to five activities per class. These may include vocabulary development, grammar practice, pronunciation, listening skills, verbal fluency, reading and writing. However, the, the main activity should be on, re, on listening and speaking. include a variety of activities, games, songs, poems, scripts, role-playing, readings, and worksheets. But again, the main activity should be engaged, having the students engaged in conversation.
I recommend putting together a toolkit of supplies. These can include um, board games. Um, there are a lot of online games that you can download. Also, um, as I said, blank board games where you can make your own. I have a picture file um, of mag pictures I've cut from magazines or the newspaper, um, pictures that um, evoke language. Um, Post-it notes are very handy for making graphs um, of information. Um, for example, um, students write down their um, three important events in their life on three post-it notes and post it on the timeline that I've drawn on the board. Um, play money. Uh, I actually like to use real money. I haven't found play money to be um, that accurate. Uh, small individual whiteboards. You can get them at the dollar store for a dollar. Great for students to do a quick answer and hold it up. Playing cards. I was um, Surprised, but then not surprised that a lot of students weren't familiar with playing cards. So after um, introducing the game where they draw a card and answer the question, I put together a PowerPoint about um, playing cards and taught them a few games and gave them all a deck of cards to bring home to teach the game to their families magazines for them to find and cut out pictures, index cards, dice, props for role playing, pictionaries, again, um, having um, stuff um, for the students to um, have real things to manipulate and, um, and not just everything um, in a picture. So we try to teach by example and repetition. Try not to get bogged down on teaching parts of speech or and grammar rules. Um, but there are exceptions. Um, there are some things that are good to point out to students. A lot of these rules we do, but we don't know that there's a rule to it. For example, um, when you consider the ED ending on a verb, sometimes it's pronounced T as in walked. Sometimes it's pronounced D as in hugged, and sometimes it's pronounced id, as in ended. Now, as an English speaker, you probably don't make any errors, but you probably hear your students make errors. So they might say, I walk it in the park. So do you know the rule behind why it's sometimes pronounced T, sometimes with a D, and sometimes with an id? Just give people a couple uh, seconds okay. to respond here. Mm -hmm. Um, so people are saying, yes, they do. Um, so walk, this is a, oh, sorry. go on. Uh, walk is the present tense. Walked is the past tense. Um, 
different consonant. But, but when you think when we pronounce "wad" with an e d, we say "wat" with a t sound. But when we say "hugged" with an e d, we pronounce it with a d sound. So there is a rule behind why that is. And it's something that's helpful to teach. That's a grammar, um, a pronunciation rule that's helpful to teach your students. It has to do with voiced and voiceless consonants. Any other comments? Um, so, some uh, uh, Julia asked if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. Okay. And this is something that I have my students do. If you put your hand on your throat, your um, hand gently on your throat, and you say d, 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 make the d sound you'll feel a vibration, correct? Everybody practice that. Yeah. You should feel a vibration. Now, when you pronounce the sound of T, it's produced at the same point of contact with your teeth and tongue, but it's whispered. T, t. If you make the T sound, there is no vibration. So if a word ends with a voiced consonant, it will have either a D sound or an ED ending. So a G, G, G is a voiced sound. So hugged, d, you would hear the voice D. But walk is the voiceless sound. So voiceless sounds end in T. The voiceless sounds would be K, C, S, S, H, P. And they usually have an opposite that is voiced. So B and P, B is voiced, P is unvoiced. G and K, the hard sound of G, G is voiced, the unvoiced is K. -K. So um, same with F and V. One um, V is voiced, F is voiced, is voiceless, or unvoiced. So puffed would end with a T sound. I know we're having a little um, phonetics lesson, but is that, do you understand? Um, you can go online and just Google ED um, pronunciation and, and you'll find lots of charts um, that will point you in the right direction. But it's a good um, grammar rule, I mean, a good pronunciation rule to teach your students. but in general, you don't want to be bogged down in rules. Okay, this is a big one. Be aware of how much talking you are doing relative to student talk. Um, if anyone is a teacher, you know that we love to talk. And um, it's important that the students have lots of opportunities to talk in class. In one way is to do more asking than telling. Also try to declutter your speech and limit the use of idioms. I didn't realize, but um, I evidently use the word so a lot when I speak. And one time a student raised his hand and said, 
what is so? So I decided to, you know, I mimicked sewing and said it can also be used as a placeholder when you speak. And then I asked him if that helped and he looked confused and he said, you always say so. And I realized that when you pointed it out, I realized that, oh my goodness, practically every sentence I say, I start with the word so. Like, so now we're going to, and so what did you think of that? And so this and so that. So again, um, try to be aware of not cluttering your language and um, not overusing idioms. Try to use natural English. And that means um, things like contractions. Flexibility and adapti adaptability are key. Um, if something isn't working well, make adjustments or move on to another activity. Um, one time we had our regular class of 16 balloon to 24 students one night. And so we had to readjust and, and change um, the format of what we were doing to accommodate um, the unexpected large group. View yourself as both a language and a cultural guide. Um, they are learning English, but they are learning also about culture in the United States. Um, and there have been times that we have had to speak privately with stu a student who um, may not be um, tolerant of another student's religion or maybe their um, social status. And we will often say things like, well, um, in the United States, um, this is how it's done or this is um, what our, we value. Um, so yes, there, um, it is something that is, um, that comes up when you're teaching English. Um, the last recommendation I think is really important, um, which is to keep it light and have fun. Uh, this, if you go by any of our classes, you hear a lot of laughter. Um, that's what gets people coming back for more. Um, my um, co colleague, John, um, says, um, Inglés sin dolor, um, which always gets a laugh from our Spanish speaking students. English without pain. Um, and here is a group from the Dunedin Library um, that shows um, what we're all about and what we try to do um, when we have our students into class. They vote with their feet. And if we're meeting their needs and making an hour and a half meeting something fun and engaging, they will come back. So thank you everyone. Um, now it's a good time to um, ask any questions, um, um, offer any um, of your own experiences. Um, we'd love to have you share. So we'll we'll give people a minute or so to uh, okay. answer. Um, I do just want to reiterate that um, the all the handouts and the PowerPoint are are up on the um, Google Drive uh, now. So uh, that that li that link will continue to be live. Um, I, I'm not going to shut it down or anything. So you guys can take it with you and use the handouts there. Um, 
we are, Jan, we do have, there, there was one particular slide where there wasn't a handout for, so I'll just kind of get with you later and um, we can um, kind of, we, we can see if we can get that sent out to them. Um, oh, is that the I think it was, cultural iceberg? It wasn't the cultural iceberg, it was the three, uh, the uh, three categories, the one at the very beginning. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the only one. So we'll, okay. we'll go ahead and send, I'll update the link with that particular handout as soon as we have it so you guys can see that. Um, so um, we have someone asking if uh, they can see the second to last slide again. This one? Um, I'm not sure. So <laughs> if this is the right one, please. Uh, no, the, the pic, I guess she's referring to the picture. <laughs> The picture, this one? If that's not right, please let us know. Oh yes, that's the one. <laughs> um, so uh, we do have another question here. I understand that conversation is increasingly tough on the citizenship test. Do you know if this is true? Um, I haven't actually heard that. Um, one, one of our, um, at one of our sites, we do have citizenship classes um john um john trozer is, um teaches it um and along with gay um i can't remember her last name but um they have had a very good success rate but i know that they're you know they're always changing it and um i haven't heard from them um that it's been difficult for the student. But I know it was a pretty limited um, verbal test before, so maybe they have made it harder. Um, we, have a, we have a question here. What, what have you tried that did not work? Oh, gosh. Even after seven years, there are things that don't work. Um, well, it's a common activity um, you see where um, they have a survey where they go around and um, ask someone, you know, ask someone if they play a musical instrument. It's usually a grid with maybe a dozen questions. And so when I, um, the first one I put together, it was so, it just felt like a, a um, a balloon with a hole in it because there were too many different kinds of questions. So the beginners could not switch from a uh, do you have question to a uh, where were you question or um, do you like question. There were too many different kinds of questions. So um, yeah, there are um, things that don't um, work. Um, usually it's um, having too much too fast and um, breaking it down more, breaking it down more in terms of vocabulary, um, maybe pre-teaching vocabulary. Um, we always let their, the students use their native language support, whether it's them Googling uh, vocabulary or asking each other. Most of our students are Spanish speaking, but, um, and they support each other, which really helps the beginners um, if it's the activity is a little bit overwhelming. They have language partners who can help them. All right, so we have a comment here. Um, I like Kathy's cards, which is a set of several hundred question cards I use in a pinch. There are some excellent topics. So that's called Kathy's cards. Kathy with a K? With a C. Kathy's. Oh, with a C. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kathy, like the name Kathy. Yeah. If there's a oh, website okay. for it, I'll try to find it and I'll upload it to the um, to the Google Doc. Um, we also have a I, so, yeah. 
We also okay. have another question here. What are the elves and Santa saying? What is the script for each of the roles? This is a great activity next month with my students. Oh, well, um, I can't answer that question now because this was done at one of the other sites at Dunedin Library um, that Pat Bauer, our um, LCOP president, leads. And I'm sure she has it in her files that it was probably a reading, could have been the night before Christmas, actually. Um, I'm not sure, but I can definitely um, get it to you if, um, on the um, last slide or somewhere, maybe the first slide I have my email address, I can um, give it to you again and then you can email, anybody can email with any questions or, um, you know, any um, links uh, that you'd like. I um, included my favorite resources for teaching English conversation. I pretty much can find anything I want. I've um, really begun to enjoy using PowerPoints with my students because I can really tailor the class to the PowerPoint. Right now, I'm teaching a class at one of the local elementary schools. We have a few elementary schools with majority Spanish-speaking families. And so we knew that our classes were, were hard for moms to get to when we thought, well, it would be great if we could meet them at school when they drop off their kids in the morning. So that's what we got. Um, two of the elementary schools, one um, is on the fourth year of their program at Dunedin Elementary. And um, I'm on the second year of a program at Skycrest Elementary. And um, we, our topics are um, school related also. Um, for instance, um, our topic might be sleep. And I have a slideshow about the importance of sleep for children at different ages and um, what time they should go to bed in order to have an ample amount of um, sleep and, and what happens when a child doesn't get enough sleep. So uh, we try to meet the needs of our students and, and go to them where they are. All of our sites invite um, parents to bring children. So um, at some of them, their um, teenagers are um, doing childcare in the children's room of the library. Others that the babies and toddlers are over in a corner of the room and um, playing with toys and having snacks. And um, um, it's, it's great. Um, we want people to be able to come. And if that means bringing their kids, where they're welcome to. All right, so we have a couple more uh, suggestions. People have uh, brought up uh, Quizlet mm -hmm. online. Um, and uh, let's see, that's it. So Quizlet online. And as soon as you get me the script, uh, or if you find anything on the, the Christmas script, I can um, upload all of these. I have a, a, I've written down a list of the suggestions that people have given me. And I can just go ahead and upload those to the, um, to the Google Docs. Um, okay. Site as well. So mm -hmm. uh, as soon as I have that, I, I can upload that there. Um, let's see. We have some more comments here. Okay, we'll only do uh, one more comment because we're kind of running short on time here. Uh, mm -hmm. it's good that so many people have have questions. Um, uh, so let's see. I find that the class becomes very close with each other, uh, which encourages them to attend. Many students may not have family members with an open support system, uh, which openly support them learning English. They do always know that there's classmate that their classmates do support them. Oh, that is so true. And yes, I, I find, um, especially our mom's class, that it's really become like a social activity that they look forward to every week. Uh, I actually had one mother who um, is a parent of a child I tutor and 
she was interested in coming to the class and I said, sure, um, you know, I'll pick you up because she was outside the school um, um, area. And she said, no, that's okay, I'll walk. Well, she was ready to walk something like three miles to get to class. Um, but of course, you know, I said, no, you know, I'll pick you up, but that's how much um, they look forward to, um, you know, having a chance to interact socially and do it in English and, and have fun while they're doing it. All right. Um, so I believe that's all the time we have here today. Um, Jan, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I do want to mention- My pleasure. I, I do want to mention that we're going to, I'm going to send a follow-up email to everyone. Please uh, complete our survey um, that I send around. Um, the survey um, kind of informs what we might want to discuss and elaborate on in the future. The reason why we have English conversation right now is because people have filled out surveys saying they wanted it. <laughs> so, um, so mm -hmm. please give us your comments, give us your feedback. Um, also, um, for those of you who, who want more, I had a couple of comments saying that they wanted more English conversation. We do have regional symposiums that are coming up. So please check out our website, uh, floridaliteracy.org, um, and that should be under literacy news on the front page. Um, you'll see a link to sign up for some regional symposiums, and the topic is gonna be on conversational English for that. And those are gonna be in-person sessions and a little bit longer, so they're gonna go a little more in depth. Um, other one, I'm going, um, go ahead. I'm I, was gonna, I was going to put the screen up um, that has my email on it in case people wanted to write it down. There it is. Yep. And we will have this um, uh, webinar posted up to YouTube probably within the next couple of days. Um, you can also get a certificate of attendance for this um, for, for this webinar, you just have to make sure to fill out the survey and uh, check that you would like the certificate of attendance and I can send that over to you. All right, um, Jan, do you have anything else to add? Well, I just want to say thank you everybody for attending. I'm thrilled that there's such an interest um, because there is a, such a great need and I hope to run into you at some other workshops and feel free to email me with any questions or comments. Thanks again. Thank you all.